Tuesday, God said you should have the model upstairs in one room. You should do your painting downstairs. Very good idea. How would you suggest we visualize the model while you're uh, lecturing? In your head. <laughs> This is a, actually a very intellectual course. Drawing is a very intellectual business. I've experimented both ways. Uh, usually if I have a model here, easily three-fourths of the students spend all their time just drawing the model. And the uh, intellectual information that doesn't seem to enter their heads. But sometimes I have them. Uh, Today we're going to do the arm. I, get, I think we take the right arm. We came down the left leg, let's do the right arm. Uh, this is the humerus. Uh, this is the ulna. This is the radius. And uh, this is the hand. Uh, The hand is a good deal like the foot. It has this package of bones here that's called the carpus. Down there is called the tarsus. The bones here are called the metacarpal bones. Meta means beyond in Greek. And these are the phalanges. This is the phalange of the thumb. The thumb only has two uh, digits or phalanges, like the great toe. Uh, as I've stressed, and I think perhaps I can break out, there are a great many intellectual analogies between the leg and the foot and the arm and the hand. The, uh, I think we might draw a back view. Uh, the shoulder blade, as you know, has this nice, uh, uh, pretty much spiral plane on it, which is much admired by artists and used as a construction line, really. I would imagine the top line would be used as the construction line. And if you can throw that in, you can, of course, always place the entire shoulder blade. It uh, then has behind it a plane that uh, supports the uh, spine itself, a down plane, which is why I put shade on it. In the illusionary drawing, we keep the up planes light and the down planes dark under most circumstances because we feel that the light comes from heaven or above us. Uh, well, it always has. We've had the sun in the daytime, moon at night, you know. We have that very deep in our subconscious. There is behind that a plane which is like a portion of uh, an eggshell. And uh, perhaps on this, uh, this is somewhat uh, three-fourths back view. I think it's come out like that. This is called the glenoid cavity. Uh, glenoid simply means shallow. Uh, here's another glenoid cavity we'll get uh, next week, or the week after, I guess. That's where the jaw fits into the zygomatic arch. Uh, that's not a pure hinge joint, you know. There's a little grinding motion there because you have to grind your food. Uh, this, of course, is a, a ball and socket joint. The very name gives us shape conceptions. Just as down here, we have a ball and socket joint. And, of course, that's a very pure ball. You see the celestial engineers, when they wanted to, could be very simple. But most of the time, they're so complex that the uh, human mind has never yet analyzed this skeleton. 
They had the problem, evidently, of making a uh, rigid skeleton that would perform all the tasks that would come up in the future. Uh, the muscles, of course, are different. They take on uh, different shapes, though they always start at the same place on the rigid skeleton and end on the same place. That's why you can more or less secret out, uh, uh, make up a secret figure in your own mind if you can really feel the skeleton underneath it because the skeleton remains so consistent right through the ages, you know. There's no difference between a Roman soldier's skeleton and the skeleton of an astronaut. And uh, our skeletons will probably remain the same despite the bizarre tasks we attempt in the future. But the muscles differ a great deal. Uh, they're fat, they're thin, they're long-bellied, they're short-bellied, you see. As artists, we have to notice that. Uh, this bone here is called the humerus. The humerus. And uh, it, of course, has a ball on the top to fit in the socket. And it protrudes just a touch with a bump here called the greater tube tuberosity. And then it falls, for all uh, artist purposes, uh, two shoulder blades lengths. <coughs> uh, I think from the top of the... Uh, gee, that seems awfully long. About down here. And it has on it two very important points. These things here. Little bumps. Those are called the condyles, and they're great landmarks for us. Uh, uh, for several reasons. If you can place the condyles, uh, you can still the rotation of the upper arm. And you know you really can't draw a line on anything unless you know how much it's rotated. Which, of course, brings you to those two terrible words, aspect and position, which you will not find listed in the artist sense in the dictionary at all. Uh, you can define them if you know what the anatomical position is that the doctors use. It is, it is this. And it's from this that they get all that terminology. Everything in front is anterior, everything beside is posterior. Uh, everything up is up, everything down is down. So it doesn't matter whether the corpse they're dissecting on is lying on the table with his palms on the table. They'll call this the front of the hand, because that comes from the anatomical position. Uh, that enters into our uh, draftsmanship quite a lot, because when we try to solve perspective problems, we can solve them in no other way than to think of the figure as blocked. And we draw the blocks either actually or in our mind, in perspective, and fit the forms in them. Uh, that's what foreshortening really is. Foreshortening is perspective, and it's why it's so hard for beginners, because perspective is a tough little course. And very few artists ever go through it. I don't know why, but they never do. Very few artists investigate other drawing systems besides perspective. Uh, perhaps, of course, you can't learn perspective unless you learn the architect system, which is called orthographic drawing. Uh, but the great artists of this century have known these things. And they know 15 or 20 other drawing systems and, of course, have made remarkable uh, uh, effects with them. So I think you might study reference planes and drawing systems if you're very ambitious, like uh, cavalier perspective, military perspective, things of that sort, oblique perspective. It's also fun to go through ancient uh, art and find out exactly what drawing system they were using. If you study these matters, which of course are all in the books, like so many things. Uh, it's possible if you took up an art drawing system, you would be considered by your peers as highly original. Uh, though God knows there's very little original in art. Uh, Another thing about these condyles is they're marvelous for proportion. Uh, I like to suggest that the basic proportion may well be the width of the head. 
because you can double it and get to the pit of the neck and you find that it's the height of the shoulder blades and the width of the shoulder blades and a couple of the make an arm and you can find so many analogies that I rather suspect the celestial engineers had a head width in their mind. Uh, where they picked up this height width, which is very old, certainly back to the Greeks, uh, I don't know, but I do know that if you measure the body in heights, it frequently falls on fleshy landmarks and that they're not consistent in the least. Uh, skeletal landmarks are. And the width of the head system, the width of the head system falls again and again on skeletal landmarks. You see, it falls on here, falls on here, falls on the tip of the tenth rib, falls on the pelvic point. Three of them make the lower arm. And uh, it's a very nice little system. There are others if you wish to study them. But one thing we really ought to do is to, is to feel the proportion of the width of the condyles here in relation to the width of the head. Uh, it's approximately one third. Uh, I say that because all beginners make enormous elbows and enormous hands just the way they make enormous knees and enormous feet. Uh, the skeletal knee distance isn't much more than one half. When you get the flesh on, it's a little more, uh, which is practically the same as the distance across here where you get those great big feet. Let's see how different it is. I have a feeling that the width of the foot at the end of the metatarsals is about as big as the flesh knee, although here it's just the same as the skeletal knee. Uh, the hand, of course, is much smaller than all beginners think. Uh, they make enormous hands, I think perhaps because there's so many details in them that they think of the details and forget the mass. But as I probably said last time, uh, uh, every now and then you ought to put your hand in your mouth. Because uh -huh. then you'll see that your hand isn't very much bigger than your mouth. And yet people make it three times bigger than the mouth again and again. Uh, so relate the distance between the condyles to the distance at the end of the metacarpals and relate the distance across the knee here to the distance at the end of the metatarsals. Uh, and it'll, it'll hold you down in proportion. Well, of course, uh, We get down here. Uh, now, uh, all laymen, when they draw the bones, as I pointed out, they will draw a sort of a rod. They put something on one end, they'll put something on the other. But that's not what artists do. Uh, artists look to see what's at the end of the bone, you see. And if they have a real bone, so much the better. And they just try to see what the shapes are. And uh, they find down at the bottom of this bone uh, that there's a spool. Uh, there's a spool there, which the ulna will bite. And uh, it's a cockeyed spool because instead of going like a regular spool you find in your mother's sewing basket, you see, it goes this way. That's very different. And of course, that makes a lot of difference in drawing, as we'll see in a second on the front view. Uh, I guess we better draw a side view. We'll draw a side view. In which case, we'd have the uh, spine of the scapula going back uh, brutally and the shoulder blade riding, rising. Uh, shoulder blade is a whole point upward on a, uh, on a resting figure. Uh, we see the little plane underneath and we see the glenoid cavity. <coughs> uh, the uh, bone fits in there, of course, great big ball. with a bump on it, and it uh, falls with a little curve on the end. A little curve on the end. 
Uh, now we're looking at the outside. Let's put a little more shoulder blade in here. We're looking at the outside, so first we would have to sense more or less the condyles. And they're not very big, they're just little bumps. In fact, they call the epicondyles. And beyond them, uh, we'd see another form here, a ball. We'll talk about on the front view. And then beyond that, we'd see the spool. Oh, I think I'm doing a left shoulder blade. I didn't mean to do that. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, now, perhaps we can see what the ulna does. The ulna has a sort of parrot's beak on it. Which one are we doing? Oh, we are doing the left one. The ulna has a sort of a parrot's beak on it that bites the spool, you see. And of course you have a hinge joint. Uh, all the ulna can do, this is the ulna, all through life is just go up and down, and up and down, like that. So the uh, ulna bites that spool and moves forward. And it will be one fifth of this bone here. Uh, there's a very nice uh, little uh, proportional business about these bones. And they are so constant, as I say. And that is that this is the longest of the bones. The femur, the tibia down here is one-fifth less. The humerus is one-fifth the tibia. The ulna is one-fifth the humerus. And the hand is one-fifth the uh, ulna. There's one-fifth off on each one of those bones. And again, there must be some good reason for that. There are very peculiar functional engineering reasons in this uh, mystic thing, uh, I'm sure. Uh, and very often they seem to be, be, be beyond the uh, mind of man to analyze. <coughs> Well, I think a front view would be in order. Be a front view of the left one. Uh, on the front view, I suppose we'd get a feel of the rib cage and feel the point of the shoulder. And uh, uh, things move like that, we'd hardly see the shoulder blade through the rib cage, but we would very well sense the glenoid cavity, uh, <coughs> which looks up a bit, and feel a shoulder blade in there of some sort. And the uh, big ball of the bone would go in, uh, protected by the slight downward slant of the point of the shoulder, which as you realize is this thing. Of course, the doctors have a name for that. That's the acromion process. Uh, we artists call it the shoulder point. And it's a great landmark for us, this point here. You can almost always see it on the model. Uh, the uh, ball of the bone is clear. And uh, the, the bump on the end of it is clear. And the bone falls. And now we know what's on the bottom of it. <coughs> a, a spool, which is very, and we'd be quite careful in our distance across there. Probably glance up at the head. I think it's quite good when you're drawing to take a glance at the head very often to hold your proportions down. Because the width of that head, and the width is back here, you know. Uh, the width of that head is a, a nice constant. And uh, so we might make that maybe a third of the width of the head. Uh, underneath is the spool. And next to it, a ball or sphere. Uh, those conceptions scarcely have to be refined. Uh, the uh, mechanics are so clear. Now, uh, the rib cage, as you see, is in here. Uh, see how the bone is arranged so that it clears the rib cage. 
because evidently we were animals that had to run about like this on all fours and it would be necessary for the bone to clear the rib cage, you see. Uh, now, the ulna bites the bone, but of course, on account of the quality of the sphere, it goes off in that direction. You see, the arm is not straight as the beginner thinks. The arm comes down here. What arm are we doing left? Comes down here and then goes way out, you see. There's a big change in angles. If you're starting to draw, of course, you have a great tendency to move towards the vertical and towards the horizontal. Uh, uh, less in country people than in city people, you find, if you teach. But in the country, all we, uh, I mean, in the city, all we see are these post and beam uh, things, you know, post and beam architecture. So we see horizontals and verticals, and we get the feeling the human body is that way. But it's not at all. Uh, so the ulna bites the spool and uh, uh, goes off in this direction. Uh, very, in a most pronounced manner. And it starts quite large, and it has a bump on the bottom, and it would be about one-fifth the length of the humerus. Uh, that bump on the bottom, I think we all know, it's this great bump here that always shows up at the wrist. Uh, next to it is the radius. And the radius is hollowed out on the top and pushed up against the ball. And uh, there's a gentle S-curve, and it ends up very large, though not as large as the width across here. It's narrower than that. Uh, because the radius is going to hold the hand. Uh, for the artist, the radius and the hand are one. Uh, <coughs> uh, this is the radius. And the hand articulates, as the doctors say, or moves against the radius. Uh, there's hardly any connection whatsoever between the ulna and the hand, one little tiny ligament. So the artist always thinks of the hand and the radius in conjunction. Uh, now we know how long the hand will be because it'll be one-fifth the ulna. You see, it'll be about so big. And half of that will be the so-called body of the hand. Uh, so the hand will uh, not be so hard to draw because we can feel the body sort of that way and throw out a few fingers and give it a thumb. Uh, and we're doing this sort of thing, we're out of the palm side. Uh, but we will keep in mind this distance in relation to this across the body and try not to make this 20 times bigger down here. I'm always embarrassed by some of these simple things I say, as I said last time. Uh, there are always a number of professional artists here who know most of these things, but I also know I have lots of beginners. So I have to talk to a very mixed audience, you know. So if I seem too simple, do forgive me. Uh, if I seem too complex, do forgive me. <laughs> Times I get so complex, I can't understand what I'm saying myself. <laughs> Uh, now, you see the way things go? We move vertically there on the anatomic position, then out, and then back again, really back more than I, than I drew. Uh, that's a rule that plays deep in drawing, that as you move from form to form in the human body, uh, you change thrust, as they say, or the position of the form. Or, or it's very liable to change. I mean, you can hold the finger straight, but... Uh, Normally, the body likes to change as you move from one form to another in direction. Of course, there'd be a radius here, pushing up against the ball, and uh, it would move along and become really uh, very large and overcome the ulna there in size and get ready to hold the hand, and the little hand would be in here. Uh, this is, uh, see, this view. Oh, the left side, I'm doing this view. Uh, so there'll be a thumb here someplace. Well, there's a little talk about the bones. You can study them a lot if you wish. 
and uh, it will pay dividends. Uh, but now let's think about function because function creates form. Uh, how do we do this? You see? All the muscles on the upper arm here are engaged in doing this. Flexion and extension, they call it. Well, we open up the arm with the triceps muscle. The triceps muscle, that means three heads. And indeed it has three heads and a common tendon. And uh, it's on this back view. <coughs> It's on this back view. If you don't mind, I'll send the uh, radius sort of into the board. You can imagine going in there very fast. And the ulna very fast into the board. Uh, the the uh, common tendon rises and stops abruptly, like that. And of course, it's attached to the end of the ulna. And we can see here that uh, <clears throat> uh, if I had a, uh, a tendon on the end of the ulna there and I pulled on the end of the ulna, it would open up the arm, you see. Uh, that's what the triceps does. It opens the arm. It wouldn't do it in this case because it would let gravity do it for it. Don't forget that body of yours is entirely and subconsciously alive to gravity, and it's not going to do any work unless it has to. Uh, it's rather strange on the human body that the ulna does not project uh, quite a distance out, because if it did, the triceps coming down here would get much more leverage, you see. And you'll find it does on most of the animals, especially those who have to make a quick getaway. But on us, it does not, and again, I don't know the reason. It might, uh, it might be partially sexual, because, of course, you've got a graceful arm there. If, imagine meeting somebody who's only came out to here, you know, you could uh, <laughs> scarcely want to reproduce the race with them, you see. So that may be what it is. Uh, but it certainly is not as efficient as it could be. Uh, just look at the next animal you see and see how far back his ulna protrudes, especially if he's a fast mover. Uh, <laughs> there are three heads that go into this uh, <coughs> common tendon of the triceps. The uh, outside head, which uh, we're in the back, the outside head, which starts at the, uh, oh no, I'm so sorry, uh, the uh, inside head, which grows off the bone. and the outside head, they're very much the same. That grows off the bone. And then the long head, which comes from the bottom of the glenoid cavity. Now that's an important landmark, because we drive the line of the bottom of the arm there frequently. And we get so we can see through the body and see the bottom of the glenoid cavity. You see, in figure drawing, Frequently, we drive our line from the insertion of a muscle to the origin or vice versa. And if we can't visualize those darn things, we can't drive the line very correctly. <clears throat> and there's one thing about a line, and that is we have to know where it's going before we draw it. Which, of course, is true of shapes. We have to know what the shape is. We have to be creative enough to create the shape before we draw it. You see, that would apply to all these bumps on the body. We can't draw them unless we create the shape. It also applies to shade. We have to know which way the shade is moving, from dark to light or light to dark, before we can put the shade on. Uh, so that's what well-trained artists can do. Uh, The long head starts at the bottom of the glenoid cavity and comes down and merges with the inner head. Now, that's a muscle group. And we have this rule in anatomy that if two or three muscles <coughs> we have approximately the same function. We group them together and we do not, uh, we do not press the details, you might say. So true of the hamstring group on the back of the leg, the quadriceps group in front, and many other groups of the body, as we see down here. 
down here, as I've told you, I think you have 27 muscles. And uh, that frightens most people to death. Uh, and they think they'll <coughs> give up anatomy and uh, go into the supermarket business or something. <laughs> but uh, what we do down here is think function. And we find there are three functional groups here. And so this all becomes very simple for artists. They just know those three groups are there and they draw them. As one group flexes the hand, another extends the hand, and the other, according to the artist, rotates it. And they all come from up here. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting line, a line we look for throughout the body. Uh, this would be called the line of the insertion of the fibers. And you'll see it again and again in the works of first-rate artists. Of course, if you can find a line on the body, you seize it. Because if you can draw that line correctly, it will not only give the illusion of the shape over which it's passing, but the direction of the shape. Uh, you see, if you take a cylinder that's absolutely upright, the way an arm might be, and you throw a rubber band around it that way, it goes that way. But if that arm comes like this, a small detail to be sure. If the arm comes like that, of course the rubber band now begins to go that way, and this part here, or this part here, it takes on a very different character, though it's rather subtle. It's convex to the top. If you push the arm forward, of course that little line which they love would be uh, convex to the bottom. Now that's the way draftsmen think. Can you see the relationship between that and this line here, which runs over the cylinder of the teeth? You know, if you put your head down ever so slightly, the commissure central line of the mouth, of course, will curve convex to the bottom. Put your head up slightly, it'll curve convex to the top. Don't think you can see those things on very mild movements. Those are the intellectual things that I was talking about, uh, and of which draftsmanship is composed. On the uh, side view, we'd see the uh, Achilles, uh, not Achilles, the common tendon rising, about like that. And the uh, outer head going into it, and the inner head with the long head going into it. And now you can see certainly that if that muscle pulls, it will extend the arm, as they say. And that's the function of the triceps. Uh, on this view here, we run into one of those cases where when we look at the front of the body, we see the back. Uh, perhaps you remember it down here on the leg. When you look at the front of the leg, you see the calf in the back on this side, particularly. And even on the other side, if you know your anatomy. Uh, because uh, soleus takes the outline on the other side. Uh, when you look at the front of the head, you see the back, you see it's widest there. When you look at the pelvis, you see the front, because the buttocks are squeezed in, you see. So of course an artist goes all through the body <coughs> to find out where it's narrow in front and wide in back and vice versa. versa. Of course the way the artist really does that is to draw what they call contour lines. Now, it, when you're doing your drawings in the school, you see a counter line is a line that a little bug with ink on his feet would make if he traveled over this body. And uh, there's no better practice in drawing than to do that. Also, if you're drawing the model, to draw it around the back where you can't see it. Because you know what you get then? You get the cross section of the body. Now, draftsmanship is all mixed up with architecture. But remember, perspective springs from architecture. And any good artist, when he looks at the front of the body, can visualize the side. He can visualize the, the side, which is the side elevation. This is the front elevation. He can visualize the plan and all the planned sections of the body, all the way from the top of the head to the balls of the feet. 
If he couldn't do that, he couldn't do uh, uh, traditional shade. So draw a lot of contour lines. There's no better way to teach yourself drawing and to get so you can remember this body. You can draw them in any direction you want. Uh, but I would think perhaps the horizontal and the vertical are the most valuable. Uh, though I did have an instructor who made me draw them like a, uh, what do they call it, a domino suit, you know, with uh, lines this way and lines this way. Uh, well, here, though we're looking at the front, we, we really want to see the back uh, first. Uh, we'd see the triceps bulging out considerably and uh, going down into the common tendon back there. So that's the story of the triceps. <coughs> uh, now, uh, we know how we open up our arm. Now the question is, how do we flex it? And most people know it's done by this muscle in front the biceps. Uh, most people don't know that the biceps is a group. Uh, there is the biceps proper, but underneath it is what artists call the pillow muscle, and the doctors call uh, brachialis antiquus. Uh, but the function, the function of both of them is to flex the arm. The pillow muscle, on the front view here, uh, grows out of the bone uh, about there, I guess. It comes down, brachialis antiquus, comes down, it's just about the same size as the biceps that covers it, and it goes into the head of the owner. Covering the bone, naturally. The biceps it has itself, that means a two-headed muscle, has two heads. And one head comes from a, uh, this process here <coughs> that uh, we call the coracoid process. Uh, you'll notice on the shoulder blade there's this thing that sticks out here and to a certain extent it protects the joint but also it receives, I think, three muscles. And uh, that we can draw in here, and we try to see through and, and remember it if we can. Uh, because the, one of the tendons of the biceps comes off it. Uh, the other tendon travels over this, uh, uh, actually comes to the top of the glenoid cavity, travels over the bone and comes down what they call the bicipital canal. And then suddenly, the two muscles of the biceps appear, uh, not much bigger than the uh, pillow muscle. And they send quite an evident tendon into the, uh, into the radius there. Uh, they too, of course, uh, I mean the biceps flexes the arm. You have to realize that the radius and ulna are held together by cross ligaments, so they're practically one form. Uh, that tendon is noted by artists uh, quite often and is quite apparent. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, well, there's a good bump here either, even where it goes. Uh, uh, you can see that that tendon could also do this. Function is never as simple as you think it is, you see. Uh, so it is, is something of a pronator, as they call it. Uh, here we could see the pillow muscle coming down and sending its tendon into the ulna. It uh, gathers around the bone a bit. And then we can see in front the biceps, which would start way up here. And there's a little touch in the biceps that's, that uh, uh, finicky artists know. Uh, 
There's a little break there that is much more obvious when the muscle is in tension. Uh, but it's not a bad idea to be aware of that because people are allowed to make this line too sweet, you know. Uh, there are several breaks like that in the body that professionals are very aware of that take the sweetness out of the line. I think I've mentioned them occasionally. And it comes down here and all we'd see would be the tendon going into the uh, radius. Uh, again, this is a group of two muscles with much the same function. And I've never seen an artist yet who use that line, separating biceps from <coughs> brachialis antiquus or the pillar muscle. Uh, if we uh, run a contour line around here, uh, we'll find that pretty much we're just going over a couple of cylinders, don't you know? It has much that feeling, though of course they can be refined immensely. Uh, here, we see a very important line in anatomy. Because in anatomy, we go after the lines between the functions, you see. Uh, this mass in front will flex the arm, and this mass behind will extend it. And that's the line between those two functions. Well, it seems time for a little recess, and we'll come back and we'll finish up this arm. Thank you. And uh, I'll talk a little about these muscles here today. Uh, the details really uh, have to do with the hand, it's the tendons coming down, that uh, we study as hard as we can. And, We'll relate more about those next time. Oh, oh, I forgot. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's take the problem of somebody with their arm raised like this, which is a tough one, and see how the artist thinks it through. the head which uh, we could think of in terms of mass as an egg and a ball. Of course if we square it up we know which way it's going. It only takes three construction lines to give you the aspect of a form you know. And you should use them as students. Because you don't want to use them later, they mess up your drawing. They must be subconscious later. So for, for the beginners here, square up your wrists all the time. They're very square anyway. Uh, square up every form you can. Square up the head. It puts it in a block form uh, in your instinct. And blocks give you an absolutely perfect and correct aspect. None of the other mass conceptions we use will do that. Uh, this model would have a cylinder of a neck from the mass conception point of view. And then a rib cage, and we could, uh, we could proportionately hit that rib cage perfectly, uh, put the pit of the neck here. See, I'm taking the diameter of the ball, and doubling it, uh, and doubling it, and then I double it again, and I get to about the bottom of the rib cage. And we'll uh, try a three-fourths rib cage, which of course would have its own specific outline. Uh, if you learn the front outline, which is the same as the back, and the three-fourths, you see, for some odd reason they call this position the three-fourths, and I've never been able to trace it down exactly. If anybody really knows, I wish they'd tell me. Uh, you can more or less guess what the other positions are. But it's very important to get the feel of the outline of the ribcage right. Uh, the center line, of course, which is a construction line, uh, though a reflection of the sternum, will at once halt the rotation. You see, we can only draw things that are still. Uh, your model will realize is moving all the time, uh, usually the subtle movement from uh, vitality to fatigue. You know, they start off like this, 
and at the end of an hour's pose, they're like this. And every form in the body has moved. And those people who can only draw with their eyes and not with their brain, uh, of course, have to draw what they see, so the top of the model is very vital and the bottom is utterly fatigued, you know. Uh, that means that uh, aspect is very important because we have to create it as artists. Uh, according to our expressional intent, you see, our expressive intent. <coughs> well, now, here's another thing, which I learned through experience here. Uh, I used to have rather, I always do have a few elderly ladies in my class, and uh, they've been depressed by life, and I could well understand why. And they draw the model in a depressing way. <laughs> and I thought, well, bit by bit, I've got to try to find out what they do to make this model look so depressing. And one of the first things I found out was when they raised the arm, they would never raise the collarbone. See, when the model raises her arm, she raises the collarbone, if she does it with vitality. Because in no time at all, she gets tired. And the collarbone comes down to the horizontal. And if you draw the collarbone on the horizontal, on the raised arm, of course, you get a spiritless raised arm. Uh, look at Goya for that, who exaggerates it. Uh, so if this model is going to raise her arm, I'm going to raise the collarbone, you see, to give a little vitality here. And we just think of it as a S-shaped line. Let's never think of it as a straight line. It isn't. And if you draw it as a straight line, which it may appear on certain aspects, uh, change it just a touch so it looks like an S-curve. Uh, if we can see through the body, uh, if we can see through the body, uh, we might be able to see the glenoid cavity and the acromion process. Uh, we could then put the arm bone in. I'll, I'll show you what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I'm going to put a model with her arm up like, uh, like this, pretty much. Uh, I can't do it properly on the skeleton because the shoulder blade is riveted to the rib cage. And so it won't move, it won't rotate, but on you it isn't. There is no bony connection between the shoulder blade and the rib cage. And as I guess I said last time, the minute you raise your arm about so far, uh, this uh, tuberosity here engages the uh, point of the shoulder, and the rib cage begins to rotate, you see. So we'd have to feel a certain rotation in this rib cage in the back. Uh, we could feel the point of the shoulder, and we could have put a, a, a bone in here, feel that ball. Let's feel it very simply as a, uh, a sort of a croquet mallet. Uh, I'll tell you the reason for that. Uh, the reason for that is that these represent the condyles and uh, perhaps that spool is represented by that column and we know exactly how much the arm has rotated and uh, you don't have to draw it, you can think it, you see. And then the ulnar, of course, would bite the spool. The ulnar would bite the spool. Uh, the back of the ulnar there is very box-like and uh, there'd be a hand off here someplace. See, it's this pose here. Uh, well, now we know there's a uh, bundle line there, and we know what it is. We've drawn just a bit. Uh, we know that it's the long head of the triceps, and it would start here, and it would end where the long head uh, uh, originates at the bottom of the glenoid cavity. You see, that's a landmark. And one of the great things in learning how to draw is to constantly place landmarks on the front and the back of the body, especially on the back if you're doing the front. Get that ability to see through, because then no trouble for me at all to just draw the, uh, the line from one place to the other, you know? Uh, the uh, biceps would originate, uh, uh, would originate there, but we know where it ends up. 
you see, on the coracoid process. Uh, so our line uh, generally follows that idea, you see. That's a pretty fat girl, isn't it? You see, there's one thing we never can know, and that is how fat or how thin they will be. This flesh varies, no end. It may vary through environment, where you may choose to be a weightlifter or a watchmaker, you know. That will change our flesh. Uh, we may have a lot of fat, we may be thin. We may be a man, or we may be a woman. Uh, that will change it. But, uh, and that will change the skeleton too. The skeleton is terribly consistent uh, in terms of heights. But in terms of widths, there of course is a sexual difference, which, which is no more really than on a woman. The pelvis is as wide as from the tip of one collarbone to the other. But on a man, it's never any wider than his rib cage, ideally speaking. That would be the supposed normal. <coughs> but as far as the artist is concerned in a so-called secret figure, you can you can hold the heights on a on a man the same as the heights on a woman. Uh, but the widths, though they remain quite constant on men and women, the pelvis is narrower, to be sure. But these things we learn about the pelvis, such as the fact that the, uh, the sacrum is one-third of the width, is true on both men and women. Uh, the fact that the uh, distance from one ischium to the other is half a pelvis is true on men and women. The, uh, uh, the ratios are constant is the strange thing. Uh, but the heights we can assume to remain about the same. You, you, you see, uh, since the women's pelvis is so much wider, it really makes this thing look shorter. But it's just because it's narrow on top on a man, therefore it seems to look longer. And men are built, uh, oh, men of course are larger physically, normally anyway. Uh, now we have a, uh, Oh, we have lots of things we talked about. You remember uh, pectoralis minor? Uh, that will frequently hit the outline when the arm is raised. Uh, but since we know where it starts and where it ends on the little uh, old coracoid process there, if we can see it through the flesh, we know where to drive our line. Uh, the deltoid gets all piled up here. And it's going in between the muscles on the other side there. And it will, uh, it will flow around here and bulge up a good deal and come back to its uh, one-third origin, they say, on the collarbone. Uh, pectoralis major would go in here and uh, For a moment, it will uh, leave the outline there to uh, pectoralis minor. But pectoralis major, artists like to think of as a great big paving block here, you know. If it's a woman, they just put a breast on top of it. Uh, we talked about all those terrible things like, uh, like, uh, 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 Terry's major, which we could see here as a good line, hiding all this. And, uh, of course, Latissimus Dorsey, you remember that? Curves around here. And, uh, uh, can some of you remember these things here? These are the anterior serratus. Uh, there are five of them the artist draws. Uh, they're muscles that pull the shoulder blade around to the front. And we can see them on this gentleman quite clearly, these things here. But their whole idea is to pull the shoulder blade around. They're greatly developed on prize fighters. 
Now, Latispus dorsi is a beautiful curve, and I don't know that we could draw it unless we could visualize a pelvis back there and, uh, and feel a little pelvic crest and all that sort of thing. Uh, well, that takes a little practice. Uh, because if I'm going to draw this marvelous spiral line that artists are fond of, uh, this line here, maybe it's clearer over here, this line here, you see, I have to know where it starts and I have to know where it ends. And if I can look through and see the pelvis, uh, uh, I know perfectly well it ends a little to the inside of the high point. And uh, just because I've drawn a good deal, I can say, uh, well, right there. You see, uh, that's a, 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 a point. Uh, I don't see why students should mind putting points in their drawings because, you know, it doesn't ruin them. They hate to tell you, put lines all over them, construction lines, because they can't take them home to their family and show them to them. Because the family will say, what are all those horrible lines doing, you know? Uh, but uh, don't let that bother you too much because construction lines teach you more than anything. But points, uh, points are used by professionals well on into their life. In fact, up to their death. Uh, I mean to indicate landmarks, you see. Uh, as I came down here, I, I put a point on the pelvic, uh, on the superior anterior iliac spine, you see. Uh, and another one on the other one. And uh, it meant a great deal to me. Uh, I know as, a, uh, as an artist uh, that there are nine lines that go to that point. And so it must be very important in a finished drawing. And probably you could think of some others too. And so as I come down, I want to know where that point is because I want to know where my lines are going to go. Well, when I run this beautiful spiral of, uh, of Latismus Dorsey down here, you see it uh, <coughs> it starts uh, in front here and it takes on a great deal of uh, meat and begins to cover things up here and then of course it travels this line here is going to travel to that point in the back in other words it's going to spiral around the body to the back you see uh, in the hands of really uh, I never know what to call them but uh, finicky artists, they might well run that line over each one of the serratus as they, as they bring it around, you see, like that. Because if you run a line that way, it explains the, the form underneath. I'll tell you where artists do that all the time. In the, if this girl here had a belt, and if you were standing at a belly, and most of them do, you know, uh, I suppose she had a belt. Uh, this is for the beginners, naturally. Uh, and if that belt looks straight to you, you know, and it often does about on the horizon line, you'd never take it. You see, a straight line gives the illusion of flat form. So you pretend it was a little above or a little below, and you take that belt and you'd run it over the external oblique and over the belly and over the other external oblique. You want to improve your learning, you run it around the back and see what it does, you see. That's a contour line. It won't look that way. Uh, but artists do that because they, they really have a terrible problem. They've got a flat working surface and they have to make things appear to come out, you see. So they use every device they can think up. Uh, well, there are things here I haven't talked about. Uh, this external oblique muscle uh, though we think of it as falling from the waist going to the pelvic crest uh, actually starts up here on the uh, on the fifth rib and it has uh, uh, fingers uh, and pieces that come down on Poupart's line uh, Poupart's line is a line dropped from the middle of the collarbone down the body used by doctors for odd reasons uh, and uh, those, uh, th that muscle, uh, uh, it uh, interdigitates with this. But external oblique really starts off way up, up there. 
And you have the first piece. They look sort of like ribs here, I guess. <coughs> uh, they're not at all clear, those things there. We occasionally see the artist use them. And the first one is about like that, and the second is like that, and the third is like that, and the fourth, and the fifth. Uh, then it begins to interdigitate with Latissimus Dorsey, uh, the sixth and the seventh, uh, and the eighth, and nine, ten. And then the ninth becomes part of the front of, of this muscle here. Uh, that's the external oblique. And uh, so does the tenth. Uh, the, uh, where are my points? Uh, the eleventh seems to make the side plane, and the twelfth makes the back plane. Uh, this stuff is much better explained in uh, pictures in first-rate anatomy books than I, of course, can draw. Uh, that's what really goes on. Uh, but most artists take this piece of meat here, and they just cut it off at the waist, and there isn't any harm in it. And they bring it from the waist to the pelvic crest. And uh, they have several ideas as to its shape according to conditions. <coughs> I think now we can see that double cylindrical quality uh, that the arm has many cases when you see it out this way, biceps, triceps, with the line, uh, with the line between the functions in the middle. Uh, I'm not sure how much we talked about the deltoid. Let's take a look at it. Uh, on the back here, uh, artists like to think of the deltoid as coming from the back of the spine, uh, from the point, and from the, uh, the collarbone in front here. Uh, uh, though it's not really true. Uh, the deltoid's called the deltoid because it's in the shape of the Greek letter delta like the Delta of the Mississippi, or more probably the Nile. Uh, if we really examine a deltoid, it, it all breaks down into uh, fibrous bundles, <coughs> like this. And then longer ones down here. Uh, of course, they're much smaller than I'm going to draw. Uh, but you see, when I draw it on the outline here, that's the reflection of this group. And then there's always a little break, don't experts, right there. The deltoid will go halfway down the bone. Uh, beginners are very liable. I'm exaggerating it, of course. Uh, uh, beginners are liable to make it much too high. I I'll tell you what beginners do. Uh, wa uh, watch out for it. Uh, you know, beginners always put a concave there, and then they'll send the delta out like that. Uh, but if you just feel yourself, and feel the point of your shoulder, you'll find it fall very rapidly, about like that. Uh, there are certain misconceptions that laymen have uh, that are so constant that they must have very sound psychological reasons. And it's fun to think them out. Because, after all, we've all been children and laymen, you know. Uh, so we've now taken the road less traveled by, according to Robert Frost. This is the back view. The uh, deltoid grows from way over here. It goes over the various muscles there and spirals around into its insertion, uh, which, of course, <coughs> uh, covers all this machinery here, you see. Uh, here we see a collarbone moving to the front. And uh, people say it covers off one-third of the collarbone. 
Uh, so do about what you think it would go over the muscles there and over the shoulder blade into its incision about halfway down the bone. And then would come off here and would do the same thing. Cover that all up. I think its function is very clear. Uh, you see on this picture here, its great idea would be to pull the arm out. And that would be done more or less by the muscle bundles that descended from the uh, point of the shoulder. <coughs> here you see if these uh, bundles go into action, it can pull the arm back. And in front here, we'll see how it's capable of pulling the arm forward. Uh, watch it go now in between the two cylinders, where it uh, likes to be, likes to go. And they always say you take a third, and here you bring it over the pectoralis muscles and uh, send it over into its insertion, hiding everything, of course, that we've studied so assiduously. I didn't put the back line in here. Uh, but the back line goes to the same point. You see, it's ending up there. And uh, if we study the insertions and origins of medical books, we could easily find out where these things come from. <coughs> of course, I haven't said much about animals here. The, uh, the catalog said I would, I noticed. But all I know is that once you learn your human anatomy, it's terribly easy to draw animals. Uh, uh, you see, a horse would have a uh, head naturally and he'd have an f-shaped backbone and then he'd have a uh, fit to his neck and uh, <coughs> uh, he'd have a uh, underline to his backbone which would be a curved concave to the bottom uh, but i think in the first lecture i said that you never can tell about horses because their dorsal spines are so different from the actual curve of their backbone. And uh, they move along like that, and that's why horses look a little as if the curve of the backbone went that way, but it really doesn't. Uh, it would be sort of engineeringly wrong, you see, if it did. And he's got this beautiful uh, cervical ligament, which we also have, that goes down to his fourth dorsal. Uh, he has a lovely sternomastoid, which we have, that uh, takes hold of his jaw for a moment and goes to the pit of his neck. He's got a windpipe, which we have, you see? A little more detail of this one. Uh, and of course, he's got a shoulder blade. Now, his shoulder blade is a lot like ours, uh, in that it has a triangle on the top, a triangle below. Uh, but the spine of his shoulder blade is extraordinarily straight. Uh, because he's a hoofed animal, he has a cartilaginous extension there. Carry more muscles, I guess. He has a glenoid cavity here. And then uh, let's give him a little more uh, rib cage. He really goes like that. Uh, he has an enormous keel on his chest that comes out this way <clears throat> because he depends a lot on his pectoralis muscles for galloping over the pampas, you know, he needs a lot of strength. Uh, now, his uh, ulna, his humerus, is very strong because he's very big and rather short. Uh, his uh, uh, tibia Uh, falls directly and it's just like our arm he, down here he gets his carpus uh, but you notice his scaffold bone sticks out tremendously for leverage there for the various muscles uh, now he's lost all his metacarpal bones but one 
I have a feeling we did this all before. And he's lost all his toes but one. But on the last one, he gets his hoof or fingernail, of course, uh, down there. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was, of course, he's got a triceps like us. Uh, we see the uh, we see the long head very clearly, and we can see the outer head on this side very clearly on a horse. Seems to go like that. Uh, the inner head is like that, but behind. Uh, oh, 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 no! I've made just a little mistake uh, from what I wanted to say. Uh, the owner is very prominent, you see. Uh, though it fades away and disappears because uh, that's what happens in animals that can't do this sort of thing. And of course, the triceps goes into the, uh, into the ulna there, you see. Uh, but you see, he gets much more leverage than we do. Uh, and then with just a little human anatomy, you find out all sorts of things. Some of you have studied splenius. Uh, some of you have studied the uh, trapezius. Uh, you'll find it doesn't go to the top of his head the way ours does. <coughs> uh, I, I think I'm just doing this to show you that if you know your human anatomy, these things become so simple. Uh, look at these uh, serratus here, the horse head. Look at the next horse you see. And uh, uh, those of you who want to draw animals, you usually learn your human anatomy. You can draw, you can understand the anatomy very easily of animals <coughs> in a very short time. Uh, I know it because I did it myself. Uh, what's more, speaking from the financial point of view, and uh, heaven knows uh, that's important, uh, they say. <laughs> another, I, I, I heard the other day that you could call it the sixth sense, you know. Uh, money was the sixth sense. You had the five senses, and then you had the sixth sense money. You know? uh, speaking from the financial point of view, I've always been able to sell my horses. But I have an awful hard time selling my people. Uh, the reason I think it's terribly subtle, the, uh, uh, the expression of emotion in people is very subtle business. Uh, but people don't know what sort of emotions animals feel. And due to the pathetic fallacy, you can make a proud horse without any trouble, or a troubled horse without any trouble, <laughs> and things of that sort. Uh, so, any of you want to go into animals, there's a great animal market, as you probably know. Uh, in fact, the old, old man who runs the Grand Central Calories, I think he must be a hundred. Uh, he said to me, you know what sells better than anything in the world? I said, what? He said, white horses. <laughs> well, that's just a little hint on the side. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the horse's uh, uh, sternomastoid comes down here, and uh, uh, because he hasn't any collarbone, gets all mixed up with his, with his uh, biceps here, you see and his deltoid. And lots of funny things uh, change and happen that you could easily study. I knew them very well at one time, and it made horse drawing very easy. Oh my, I'm way beyond uh, time. Well, here, is the, here are the facts. Here is the uh, logic, but uh, I always feel as an art teacher, my job is to teach values, frankly values and uh, we're talking about animals <coughs> we might think what Walt Whitman said about the animals some of you know <coughs> uh, Walt Whitman said uh, <coughs> I think I could turn and live with the animals I stand and look at them. I think I could turn and live with the animals. Uh, they are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat or whine about their condition. They do not stay awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. 
not, uh, not one, not one is something, I can't quite remember that, not one is something, uh, not one is demented with the mania of owning things. One, not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over this whole earth. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.